Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Tend to Life where we talk everything true crime. So if you're stopping by for the very first time, welcome. I hope you appreciate today's case coverage and enjoy this channel and consider subscribing. And for all of my returning 10 to lifers, welcome back. I am so happy to have you guys here with me today on another crazy ass case. This one is all about social media, guys, and the dangers of social media and how a lot of these people actually are now using social media and apps specifically to target their prey and almost utilize it as their own personal hunting ground. It is extremely alarming, it is extremely dangerous and unsettling, and this is just one more glaring example of that. So guys, let's jump right in. Tend to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. We are taking a quick break in today's case to have a word from our sponsor. Okay, guys, so the holiday season is vastly approaching. And if you are anything like me, you wait until the very last minute and you struggle with what to get literally everybody. Well, I'm about to make your day and your holiday season with the best hack for that holiday gift fog. Established Titles is a project based on historic Scottish customs where landowners are referred to as lairds or lords and ladies in English. They allow people to buy as little as one square foot of dedicated land so that they can technically call themselves a lord or a lady. And I am talking a legit lord or a lady. They give you an official certificate, bam, with a crest and everything. The plot of land you get is on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland. Wow, say that five times fast. And your unique certificate features a unique plot number where you can actually see the exact location of your land. And get this, because it's an official document, if you like really want to be extra with it, once you can do this, you can actually officially change your name to Lord or Lady, and then get it on your credit cards, on your plane tickets, I mean, you name it. You can even do it on your dating profiles, but please don't do that and like try to become a bootleg version of the Tinder swindler. The world doesn't need another one of those things. So with my own little princess croissant turning one last month, I wanted to get her something extra special to celebrate the occasion. Something fun and something that she can brag to her friends about at her little tea parties for the next few years. So I would like to officially introduce you to Lady Emmy Lou. And look guys, we got the certificate and everything. I mean, this kid was born to be a little fancy lady. Seriously, this is such a unique gift and such a fun gift to give anyone in your life or to even gift yourself if you're feeling like you want to be just extra fancy and like extra official fancy. And they also have couple packs that come with adjoining plots of land so that you and your better half can be distinguished together. In addition to all of that amazingness of everything I literally just talked about with you, Established Titles also plants a tree with every order. And they work with the global charities One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. And Established Titles is running a mega sale right now. And if you use the code 10 to life, you get an additional 10% off. So go to establishedtitles.com slash 10 to life to get your gifts now or just to become a lord or lady yourself. Established Titles told me that the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot within a few minutes of walking. So depending on how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, we can build our little 10 to life kingdom together. Thank you so much, Established Titles, for sponsoring today's video and for making my little croissant princess an official lady of the house. I will probably never hear the end of it and I'll probably regret it into our toddler years, but it is so cute and oh my God, it's just the best. And thank you to all of you viewers for understanding that sponsors are essential if we wanna grow this channel to a place where I can deliver you more true crime all the time. Now let's jump back into today's case. Have you ever heard the saying, follow me on Twitter, like me on Facebook, or murder me on Craigslist? As a culture, we use humor to help us cope with tragic stories or horrifying events, and psychologists call this as reappraising. And it's natural for most of us because our brain innately wants us to be protected from any sort of trauma. And some critics say that this can actually lead to subconsciously neutralizing threats that we might otherwise see. But how does this affect our teenagers today? Do they recognize dangerous situations as seriously as previous generations do? Do they meet strangers online more frequently than their elders? Millennials use social media for networking, connecting with friends and family and personal interests, of course. 
I also personally know a ton of people who have met their spouse or their significant other through social media. So it feels very much like a sign of the times. Well, for millennials and Gen Z anyway. Particularly, Gen Zers love social media because it's a way for them to make online friendships and also kind of boost their self-esteem at the same time. And I remember back in the day when meeting somebody online, especially a romantic partner, was taboo. It was like you didn't want to tell anybody that you met somebody online. You would never be caught dead admitting that you signed up for Match.com or eHarmony. There was like a weird sort of stigma and embarrassment attached to it to where you didn't ever speak a word of it. You And if you ever met somebody off there and you did start a relationship, you both would lie to people about how you actually met to make it you know, appear more like an organic meeting. But nowadays, that's kind of gone all out the window and everybody, it's the standard, it's the norm. And today, the truth is that many teens are beginning their dating lives on social media apps. They can see each other's pictures, get introduced to mutual friends, chat through messenger apps, and have, you know, a romantic thing or even fall in love completely virtually. And meeting somebody online or having access to their social media also gives you the ability to go down a rabbit hole. I mean, knowing their entire family history, their dating history, seeing their ex on their boat trip from five years ago, knowing their aunt's favorite Christmas recipe. I mean, you name it. So much so that there actually are now memes about how to be very careful not to bring up a fact you know about this person in conversation that you have found out on social media because it'll show just how much you truly were stalking this person. And also be very careful because if you do that deep dive and you accidentally double tap, jig is up and you got caught. So, This is definitely a thing that is super common nowadays. And out of all of the apps, Snapchat is among the most popular apps for teens to do this very thing. And that's where this story starts, with two 17-year-olds in Wisconsin, when a boy meets girl on Snapchat. Dylan lives in Fall River, Wisconsin, with both of his parents, and Dylan met a girl who lives in Beaver Dam, which is about a 20-minute drive from Fall River. Dylan and Abby went to separate high schools, where they are both seniors, and unlike some budding friendships and romances in high school, they aren't classmates or friends and don't appear to have any mutual friends at all. Instead, they met on Snapchat on October 15th of this year. Again, if you're unfamiliar with Snapchat, Snapchat is the app where messages and pictures sent disappear after the receiver opens it, or I think even after a certain amount of time. In my generation, I don't use Snapchat, but in my generation, back when it first came out, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, it was the app that people would use to send nude photos because they knew it would disappear and they felt like there was less risk, even though, hello, you could screenshot. This is also the app that people would have affairs because the messages disappeared. I don't know if that's still what it's used for. I haven't been on Snapchat in literally a decade or so. So Dylan and Abby are talking on Snapchat, and even though they had just met online that day, the pair decided to meet up. So Abby sent her address to Dylan, and he picked her up that night. Their plans included going to Walmart in Beaver Dam and then a few other stores. While they walked around Walmart, Abby thought everything was pretty normal thus far, and nothing seemed weird. She was having fun with this new person that she met. She was getting to know him better, running errands. It all felt very casual and organic and like something was in bloom, possibly. After Walmart, they got into Dylan's Pontiac SUV, where they would soon head out on their next stop to Goodwill. But unbeknownst to Abby, their trip to Goodwill would get cut short because Dylan had a secret, and his secret was that he wanted to kill her. Around 9 p.m., a witness in the parking lot of Walmart called the police to report what they thought looked like a hit and run on a pedestrian. They claimed to have seen a Pontiac SUV vehicle bouncing up and down over something that looked like a body and squealing its tires in the parking lot while doing so. The car reversed and was seen bouncing up and down again. When police arrived at the scene, they found a wounded 17-year-old girl, Abby, in the parking lot near the auto department of Walmart, and she was in critical condition. Abby was found groaning in agony with severe road rash, and only the right side of her chest was rising and falling. Blood was coming out of her nose and her mouth. Abby was taken to Marshfield Medical Center, and then she was flown to UW Children's Hospital for treatment in Madison, Wisconsin. She was in critical condition with extremely horrible injuries. 
The following day, a Beaver Dam detective visited Abby in the hospital to see if he could gather any more information about what happened to her, who was responsible, and what went on in that parking lot. In his report, he noted that he learned that Abby had no movement below the waist and needed surgery to fix a spinal injury. In addition, both ankles were broken, one shoulder was broken, and she was covered in road rash from head to toe. Police had obtained the surveillance footage from the Beaver Dam Walmart and identified the vehicle's license plate and the registered owner, who was Clint Lenz, and that happened to be Dylan's dad. So that same day, the day after the incident, on Sunday, October 16th, officers went to the address from the car's registry and found the exact vehicle that the witness had described, that Pontiac in the driveway. There was grass jammed into the front grill and frame, a broken license plate frame, and blood on the front of the car. And officers also saw blood inside the vehicle. Inside, so not exactly a hit and run. Now, we're not exactly sure what Dylan told his parents, but they were allegedly uncooperative and very confrontational with officers. Dylan's mom claimed that the blood in the back seat was Dylan's and that he was the victim of whatever happened. Beaver Dam police then took Dylan into the Fall River Police Station to question him about what happened. Originally, Dylan said that Abby had struck him in the nose, so he kicked her out of the car and then drove away when he accidentally hit a curb. He also said that while Abby was walking away, she may have tripped down a hill. Which, I'm sorry, but you don't get those injuries from tripping down a hill. Sorry, kid. Not gonna happen. So this story was not the truth, and officers knew that this was not the truth. But the reality of what happened that day and the admission that Dylan was about to share would not only completely shock the officers to their core, but it becomes a twist in this case that nobody saw coming. Police knew Dylan was lying, not only because of the witness report, but because of the condition that Abby was in and her injuries. So finally, Dylan started telling the horrifying truth about what happened that Saturday night. According to the criminal complaint, Dylan finally began to open up to the officers about what really happened that day. Specifically, he told the officers about his experience in Walmart. He said while they were in the store, he was like, this is the last day that she is going to be alive. This is the last night of her life. Upon entering the vehicle after Walmart, Dylan grabbed a box cutter before debating what he was going to do. This is all a quote by him. Dylan then started to choke Abby and simultaneously stabbed her a couple of times in the shoulder. Dylan told officers, I was out of control. I wasn't thinking. My body just took over. According to Dylan, Abby screamed bloody murder and begged Dylan to let her leave. But before unlocking the doors, Dylan admitted to Abby that he was, in fact, trying to kill her. So this had been his plan all along, at a minimum since entering Walmart, but did this mean that he had planned this from when they first started speaking on Snapchat that day? Was he planning to do this to whoever agreed to meet him that day? And in some demented alternate universe, Dylan actually thought that if he admitted that he had just tried to kill her, that Abby wouldn't tell on him. So Dylan unlocked the car doors and Abby ran away screaming with blood dripping down her shoulders. So Dylan also told officers that he became enraged when Abby didn't believe him, which we don't know what that means. I have no idea what he's talking about here. But he told officers that Abby knew his name and could probably get his license plate number. He also, I guess, had asked Abby if anyone knew where she was and when she was expected home to know how long it would be before people would look for her. So he says, this is when I started thinking that I could get in trouble for attempted murder and I decided to drive after her. He continued his sixth story saying, I was trying to kill her. He thought if he killed her, then she wouldn't be able to report him for choking her and stabbing her. So Dylan apparently first tried to hit Abby head on with his car and then tried reversing and ran over her again because he wasn't sure if he hit her or not. At some point, he went from the parking lot up to that hill, as you can see by the tire tracks in the grass. He says that he saw Abby in front of him, put his car in drive, and drove down the hill, running her over again. After that, Dylan opened the car door and saw Abby's foot dangling and could hear her moaning in pain. That's when Dylan then saw a green vehicle approach him and thought, oh no, I gotta go and fled the scene. So when asked further about his plan, he said that if he hadn't seen that car, that he would have taken Abby's body, put it in the back of his car, 
driven away with it, and either thrown it away in a garbage bag or would have buried it. Instead, he drove away as fast as he could. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh my gosh, this kid is obviously like beyond evil. What a psychopathic little tiny twerp. But just wait because it gets even worse if you can believe that. Just when you start to think Dylan couldn't get any more evil, any more twisted, stupid, or selfish, he admitted that he texted his friend when he got home and said, oh no, I'm in big trouble. I really messed up this time. I did something really bad. I'm going away for a long time. Cracks trace the path of a near deadly car attack Saturday night in Beaver Dam. Police say 17 year old Dylan Lenz first stabbed a 17 year old girl from Beaver Dam with a box cutter. Then, as she tried to escape, police say Lenz ran her down with his car. Police say the pair met on Snapchat and were meeting in person for the first time. This case shows us that in person you can get physically harmed, and that's the scary thing is this young lady almost lost her life and she still could lose her life because of one individual um, you know we want to trust people there's a lot of good people most of the people in this world are good people but there's also pure evil in this world and according to the criminal complaint Beaver Dam police contacted Fall River police here who came over to Dylan Lentz's home and found the car parked in the driveway here and found blood on the outside of it Police took Lenz to the Fall River Police Station, where, according to the criminal complaint, he said he'd been having, quote, bad thoughts about murdering people. Police say he admitted trying to kill her, choking and stabbing the girl with a box cutter before she ran out of the car. Lenz told police, quote, I would have taken her body, put it in the back of my car and driven away with it and either throw it away like in the garbage bag or bury it. However, he was interrupted by a witness and drove off. Even police officers, sometimes we can even be uh, sort of shocked by what we hear uh, by suspects. His neighbor says she's horrified at the violence. A lot of people are meeting online too. And I don't, I don't like it. But what are they going? What are you going to do? You got to be careful, though. Who to trust? Like that young boy. You never think that's going to happen. But this isn't the worst of it, guys. So hang tight. So Dylan was charged with attempted first-degree intentional homicide and ordered to a $150,000 bond. He remains in custody at Dodge County Jail, but if he does end up bailing out, listen to these rules that the judge ordered him to abide by. As conditions of his bond, he may not have direct or indirect contact or communication with the victim, the victim's residence, the victim's family, the victim's school, the victim's medical facilities, and victim's employment. He may not have violent or abusive contact with anyone. He shall remain at home except for school, court hearings, work, and all health care appointments. Now I'm sorry, but am I the only one confused by why his bond is set at only $150,000 or why he isn't held without bail in the first place? I could understand a little bit if maybe this was more of a targeted and specific act. However, Dylan admitted that he has been thinking of murdering people for a while now, not just Abby. Perhaps Abby was just his first opportunity. Had he gotten away with her murder and the cover-up, I might be covering the case of a missing girl right now instead. Also, he tried to kill her to shut her up once, so who's to say that he isn't going to try and do that again? And with only a $150,000 bond, all he needs to pay is $15,000 to get out. That is just insane to me. And unsurprisingly, on Facebook posts by either Fall River Police or Fall River Community Pages, there is an overwhelming response from the public in the comment section. They want Dylan to stay in jail because Dylan is a menace to the public and needs to be away from innocent citizens of his community. If Dylan is convicted, he faces up to 60 years in prison. His preliminary hearing is set for November 17th of this year, so in just a few weeks. Now, Fall River Police Department issued a statement on behalf of the school district to address community concerns if Dylan does make bail. And it says that the Fall River Police Department is working closely with the Fall River School to ensure the safety of all students and staff members. As a reminder from the Fall River School, we want to reiterate that Dylan is in custody at this time, and should he be released, he will no longer be permitted on school grounds or attend school-sponsored events. There will also be an increased police presence both on campus and in the surrounding vicinity. So here's my question. What the hell happened to this 17-year-old? What causes teenagers to have such dark thoughts and want to hurt other humans? We know by Dylan's own admission that he feels like his mental state hasn't been so good recently, which, hello, obviously, clearly, and that he was having these really bad thoughts about murdering people. So obviously he has serious issues, but oh my god, how did this go unnoticed by his parents? 
and I'd like to think that his mom had no clue of her son's sociopathic tendencies since she had the nerve to be rude to officers and insinuate that Dylan was the victim here. Maybe she has other issues or maybe she just believed her son's lies that day, but we're going to get to another important detail here in a second. And maybe there was something seriously going on wrong at home, who knows, but were there seriously no signs that something was wrong with Dylan? On the outside, I guess he appears to have a normal life, and by that I literally only mean no serious publicly known trauma or prior criminal history. Both of his parents are still married, although to be fair, the information I've been able to find on him is extremely limited, and all of his social media accounts have been scrubbed completely. Even so, normal teenagers don't just randomly wake up and decide to kill someone or think about it all the time. I mean, unless you're Aiden Fucci, which if you aren't familiar with that case, it's on my channel a few videos back and is absolutely horrific. Aiden is just another little high school twerp who stabbed his classmate Tristan Bailey over 100 times after planning it for 30 days. So watch or beware, that is a very tough case video. But anyways, as it turns out, while Dylan's mom was busy lying to the police and huffing and puffing that he was the victim, Dylan admitted to police that he has been violent with his sister in the past. His own sister. He said that he got really mad when she lost his phone, but that it was a really long time ago. Now in this incident, Dylan apparently strangled his sister by choking her with his hands while asking where his phone was. A pretty normal reaction, right? Come on, come on. So did his parents know about this? Did they not know about this? Because if not, they definitely should be worried about bailing him out now and him being around his sister again because he has proven multiple times to be violent, and not only with strangers, but with those closest to him. It's also fair to say that Dylan might be struggling with a plethora of mental issues as well. I don't know if Dylan was just playing dumb or seriously didn't know the gravity of the situation, but after being read his Miranda rights, he asked the detectives what an attorney is. What 17-year-old isn't aware of the definition of an attorney or a lawyer, or not even able to picture what that is? Does he not have access to the internet, to movies, to television? He seemed to understand that he could go away for attempted murder when he texted his friend, so I don't know if I abide that he doesn't know what an attorney is. But anyways, maybe he's playing another one of Aiden Fucci's cards, like when Aiden pretended to go literally insane during his hearing and it was all an act. Meanwhile, Abby remains in critical condition, fighting for her life. And if something changes, Dylan's charges would likely be upgraded to first-degree murder. Her family has set up a GoFundMe, and I came across her sister's Facebook page as well while researching this case. She had posted over the weekend that her family was looking for Abby and couldn't find her anywhere. And it's just heartbreaking to think of what Abby went through that tragic evening because I can't imagine how scared she must have been thinking that you are finally free and you're running away from this monster who was just hurting you only to then see the headlights of his car and know that he's driving towards you and wants to run you over and then reverses over you and runs you over again. I mean, it's horrific. And while nobody could have predicted this would happen and this certainly isn't in any way Abby's fault, this story is just a shocking reminder of how fragile life is and reminds us that we can't get too comfortable, especially with strangers. Even though social media has changed how many of us interact and connect with others, we have to remember to be careful. It's never a good idea to meet up with anyone on the internet or give a stranger your address before knowing them, even as an adult, but even more so as a minor. We all think we're invincible when we're young. I've been there and I totally get it. So I can only hope that parents can do their jobs to educate their children as much as possible on the responsibility that comes with the privilege of having social media. Teenagers growing up today may need to hear a story like this as a sombering reminder to protect themselves and their personal information online and through social media apps. The world is scary, and you never know what the monsters of our world will disguise themselves as. And many of them use these very apps as their hunting grounds to find their prey. It's a very scary world and scary time right now, so please be aware and keep yourself safe. I will keep you guys updated on this case. I can only pray that Abby starts to recover and her condition lessens as far as severity, that she walks again, that she survives, and I am just so hopeful that this little a-hole twerp Dylan is held accountable to the fullest extent, which we should know more come the hearing in November. So please say a prayer for Abby and for her family, and we'll continue to watch this case closely. 
Thanks for tuning in again today, guys. Please don't forget to like this video on your way out and leave a comment below because I want to know from you, do you think that he had planned this from the moment he was talking to Abby on Snapchat or is this a feeling that he was overcome with while he was already in Abby's presence? What do you think? Planned, premeditated, or random? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks again, guys, and until the next one, stay safe. Bye.